So dear prorector, dear members of the corona, dear family and friends. Wait a minute. Ah, OK, sorry. First, I have to say something. <laughs> Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Gina Perelli, Perella will defend the academic thesis Platelet Glycoprotein 6 in the Regulation of Thrombus Growth. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. Yeah, thank you. Okay, dear Prorector, dear members of the Corona, dear family and friends, dear audience, thank you for being here today. In the next 15 minutes, I will talk about uh, uh, the content of uh, my thesis with the title, Preted Glycoprotein 6 in the Regulation of Thrombus Growth. So let's start with the brief introduction. So um, the role of platelets is to prevent excessive blood loss in case of uh, uh, vascular damage. And the uh, endothelium lining the blood vessels uh, creates a barrier which physically separates platelet from the collagen present in the subendothelium. However, when this uh, uh, endothelium is damaged, platelets are activated. Um, so at first they start uh, rolling on the subendothelium, and this rolling is very important because it favors the interaction of platelet receptors with the, uh, the ligand pre present in the subendothelium. Then platelets are activated, and uh, when they are activated, they uh, change shape, they secrete the content of their granules, such as ADP. They produce thromboxane A2, which is, uh, together with the ADP, very important for platelet activation. Then they express uh, phosphatidylserine, um, which is important for the coagulation cascade. So then thrombin is formed, and then finally thrombin cleaves fibrinogen into fibrin, which forms a mesh around the platelet, stabilizing the clot. So as I said, um, when the uh, endothelium lining the blood vessel is damaged, collagen is exposed and platelets are activated. Now, platelets bind to uh, collagen uh, through a receptor here in blue called the GP6. A GP6 is uh, an immunoglobulin receptor characterized by an extracellular domain, an intracellular domain, and then a cytoplasmatic domain. What is interesting uh, about this receptor is that uh, GIP6 deficient individuals have only a mild bleeding phenotype, therefore suggesting that GIP6 is a promising therapeutic target in arterial thrombosis. Um, in the last years, GIP6 has also been found to be a receptor for fibrin and fibrinogen, which are present in the thrombus core and the thrombus shell here, therefore suggesting that GIP6 has also a role in thrombus growth and stability. Therefore, the aims of my thesis were to understand whether GIP6 binds to fibrin and fibrinogen as a monomer or as a dimer, then to understand the role of uh, GIP6 uh, in uh, uh, thrombus formation under coagulating and non-coagulating condition, to investigate the role of, uh, fibrin dependent, uh, of GIP6 in fibrin-dependent thrombus formation, and then to investigate the role of uh, GIP6 and its signaling in the stability of the thrombus. So at first, we asked whether GIP6 binds to Fabin and fabinogen as a monomer or as a dimer. So GIP6 is known to be expressed on the platelet um, uh, membrane uh, in a mixture of uh, monomers and dimers. And before it was known that dimerization was important for activation, it was required for binding to GIP6, uh, sorry, to collagen. However, in 2015 and then later in 2017, it was uh, um, found that uh, monomeric GIP6 uh, could bind to fibrin. And this finding was surprising as it was unclear how monomeric GIP6 uh, could uh, uh, activate platelets. So then many groups uh, started uh, uh, studying this interaction and they asked whether uh, GIP6 uh, binds to fibrin and fibrinogen as a monomer or as a dimer. However, what they reached were, were many contradictory results. So we try to understand the reason for these contradictory results, and we start from the GIP6 constructs uh, used uh, by these groups to look at this binding. So here you can see the, the American GIP6 constructs, and here are the monomeric GIP6 constructs. So what we noticed was that the main difference between uh, these, uh, uh, these constructs was the presence of the stalk. Now, as the stalk is uh, negatively charged, we propose that repulsion could be uh, created between uh, the two stalks in the dimeric GIP6 constructs, therefore causing it to behave as a monomer. 
Then, as the ELISA was uh, uh, the method mostly used by these groups uh, to look at the bonding, we um, proposed that other reason could be the way fibrin was uh, uh, generated, as fibrin was generated di using different concentration of thrombin. Then, uh, how the binding was detected, because uh, some uh, groups used the GP6, uh, which was conjugated to a dye, and this could uh, change uh, the conformation of the protein. And then, finally, we suggest the use of a binding competition assay in order to uh, detect non-specific binding. Then next, we asked the role of a GP6 in thrombus formation under coagulating and non-coagulating conditions. So for this work, we used uh, uh, blood from GP6 deficient individuals. So in the world, there are 11 GP6 indefici deficient individuals, and all of them live in Chile. These individuals have an homozygous mutation, which uh, in the, um, exon 6 of GP6 gene, which uh, caused the expression of a truncated protein, which is uh, uh, not expressed on the platelet surface. And uh, GP6 deficient patients do not respond to collagen, but they normally respond to other platelet agonists, such as ADP. So to look at the role of uh, GP6 in thrombus formation on collagen, so we use blood from wild type, a GP6 heterozygous and GP6 homozygous, and then um, we look at platelet activation. So as you can see from the images here and also from the graphs here, the absence of uh, GIP6 significantly decreases uh, uh, PS exposure and platelet aggregation. Then we look at the non-collagen surface. So this surface was a surface of uh, laminin rhodocytin and VWF. And also in this case, what we observed was that absence of GIP6 significantly decreased PS exposure. Then we want to compare the role of uh, uh, GIP6 on thrombi formed on collagen in the presence of uh, uh, thrombin. So these experiments were performed under coagulating conditions. Also in this case, what we observed was that absence of GIP6 significantly impaired PS exposure and fibrin formation. However, um, platelet aggregation was not affected. And then when we sequence a pool of DNA samples representative of the Chilean population, um, we found out that there are um, around 4,000 individuals, um, asymptomatic individuals, GIP6 deficient individuals currently living in Chile. Then next, we um, investigated the role of uh, uh, GIP6 in fiber dependent thrombus formation. So for this experiment, blood was perfused over fibrin surface for 10 minutes, and then we used different inhibitors to look at the role of a GIP6. So what we noticed was that aggregates formed on fibrin were smaller to uh, those formed on collagen. So here you can see how aggregates uh, look like after 10 minutes of perfusion on collagen, and then here how they look like after 10 minutes of perfusion on fibrin. However, these aggregates were active as shown by the presence of uh, P-selectin and the level of uh, uh, PS. Now, to look at the role of uh, GIP6, so we use an inhibitor of the SIC, as uh, SIC, as you can see here, um, signals downstream uh, GIP6. What we noticed was that when uh, um, blood was uh, pretreated with the SIC inhibitor, uh, platelet adhesion as well as uh, platelet activation was uh, significantly decreased. Then we, uh, to look closer at GP6, we use an anti-GP6 uh, antibody called uh, 912. And also in this case, we, we observed that the GP6 inhibition significantly impaired platelet adhesion and platelet activation on fibrin. Then we also observed that the SIC inhibition and GP6 inhibition uh, significantly reduced the platelet aggregation response to fibrin as well as uh, intracellular calcium signaling. Then next, we um, investigate the role of uh, GIP6 uh, in uh, thrombus stability. And um, uh, so as I said before, um, a thrombus is characterized by two, region, uh, two regions, a core and a shell. And uh, as you can see here, fibrin is present in the core and uh, fibrinogenesis is that present in the shell. So now fibrin was uh, uh, known uh, to form a mesh around the platelets and stabilizing the thrombus core. However, it was unclear how um, the stability of the shell was regulated. So now, as uh, GIP6 is a receptor for fibrinogen together with the integin alpha 2 beta 3 we, wanted, we, we proposed that the GIP6 could regulate uh, the stability of the shell. And so therefore, we, are, we tried to ask this question. So for this experiment, um, blood was perfused over collagen and uh, atherosclerotic plaque for 10 minutes. 
and this is how aggregates uh, look like after 10 minutes of perfusion. And then stability was uh, uh, challenged by post-perfuse uh, these aggregates with a buffer um, containing uh, or, or not the inhibitors. And here is the, how the aggregates uh, look like after 10 minutes of post-perfusion with the vehicle. So here, um, to start with, we uh, used a stick inhibitor. So here you can see how the aggregates look like after 10 minutes of post-perfusion with vehicle on collagen. And here you can see the effect of uh, sick inhibition. So as you can see from the images and also from the graphs, sick inhibition significantly um, impaired the thrombus stability, starting within three minutes of post-perfusion. Then we look at the effect of uh, sick inhibition on thrombus stability on plaque. And what we observed was that also in this case, inhibition of sick uh, significantly impaired thrombus stability starting within uh, three minutes of post-perfusion. Then we compared um, the role of uh, sick on thrombus stability with aggregates formed at 37 degrees. And also in this case, we observed uh, that sick inhibition could induce thrombus stability. Then as um, we wanted to compare the effect of sick inhibition with that of two secondary mediators, uh, thromboxane A2 and DP, as these mediators are known to propagate from the core to the shell and then uh, um, maintaining platelet activation. So uh, what we observed in this case was that after 10 minutes of post-perfusion, inhibition of sick ADP and, and thromboxane A2 was comparable. And then when uh, um, we used a novel GIP6 uh, nanobody called nanobody 21, we only uh, observed a minor thrombus uh, uh, breakdown. So in conclusion, we shown that uh, the use of uh, uh, GIP6 constructs is always not a good mo uh, model to look at uh, ligand binding. Then we show that uh, GIP6 regulate thrombus uh, um, uh, platelet ag um, activation and PS exposure on collagen and collagen surfaces under coagulating and non-coagulating conditions. Um, then we uh, show that fibrin induced a low level of GIP6 activation, which relies on the intake in alpha 2 beta 3 And then finally, we show that uh, um, binding of fibrinogen with the GIP6 and intake in alpha 2 beta 3 is important for the stability of the shell. With this, I would like to uh, thank you, you for listening and all the people who helped me with uh, uh, this work, especially my supervisor, Steve and Non. Thank you. And, and we now give the word back to the prorector. Thank you very much. And thank you for your presentation. We will now start with the opposition. Yeah. And the opposition will be opened by Professor Tenkate. Professor Tankate is professor of internal medicine, in particular hemostasis and thrombosis at Maastricht University. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Prorector, dear candidate. Um, I'd like to congratulate you with the accomplishment of, uh, of this work. It's beautiful yep. work. Uh, it's teamwork, but your uh, input or your, uh, uh, your, your, your work is clearly uh, evident from, from, uh, uh, from the chapters. It's, it's original and it's very clinically relevant. And I also would like to congratulate the supervisory team with uh, uh, coaching you. Uh, and this work is another spin-off of the fruitful collaboration between Birmingham and Maastricht. Having said that, um, I'd like to start with asking one of your para-nymphen to read Proposition 1. The estimated high number of asymptomatic glycoprotein-6 deficient individuals in Chile makes this receptor a useful antithrombotic target without involvement in hemostasis. This thesis. Thank you very much, candidate. Um, I, I think I understand what the what, uh, proposition means, but could you ex actually explain it? Because it's, it, it's not fully implicit. I mean, the fact that people are asymptomatic, that you would then like to target that particular uh, deficient receptor. So okay. what's the trick then? <laughs> um, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Um, so I think that uh, the fact that um, there are many asymptomatic individuals, of course, without like any symptoms is a good start to think that uh, GIP6 is uh, a good receptor, could be a good receptor in, uh, um, in arterial thrombosis to target arterial thrombosis. And um, 
I think that uh, uh, besides the number of uh, GIP6 deficient individuals and uh, the 11 patients that so far have been identified, which do not have uh, a, um, a, a, a severe bleeding phenotype, there are many studies supporting the role of, uh, of uh, these receptors and uh, the fact that uh, it's not uh, um, required for hemostasis. So first of all, there are like uh, uh, our studies, um, the one performed in Chile actually with this patient, uh, where we showed that under coagulating conditions so when thrombin was not inhibited and there was a tissue factor, the aggregates could still form. And so, and another important part is that um, uh, arterial thrombosis is caused by the, 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 the formation of a plaque, and actually it has been shown that uh, GIP6 is very important for thrombus formation on plaque material. So this means that in the in a normal physiological uh, hemostasis, uh, the, the inhibition of a GIP6 is not going to affect uh, those processes, but actually could affect um, yeah, the thrombus formation on plaque. And I, und I understand. And I'm yeah. going to interrupt you because... You you're, you're um, yes. fluent, that's, that's obvious. <laughs> um, so it's, it's probably um, a good antithrombotic uh, agent or a, approach to target GP6 with mild impairment of the hemostatic system. And that's also the reason that it's currently tested in yeah. clinical trials. And you refer to, to some of these studies, in, for instance, in your introduction on page 24, references uh, 73, 74. These are studies in patients with either carotid artery stenosis or mm -hmm. with uh, coronary artery disease. Um, and uh, I first looked at, at the study uh, from Meyer and all that was published uh, last year in, in JMA. Uh, and of course, these are phase two studies. So safety is the, the key issue to look at. And what surprised me, but the numbers are not statistically significant different, but is that the, the uh, people who got, the patients who got placebo uh, had the, a higher rate of bleeding complications than the, the ones that were treated with this uh, Reva sept compound. Mm -hmm. um, so clearly no signal of harm from this study. But what was more surprising, I think that in the study that was not published yet, but you may have heard about this, with Glenzozimab, mm -hmm. the French multicenter study in which this uh, anti-GP6 agent was tested on top of standard therapy, that, so that could be thrombolysis or clot removal or, uh, and, and or aspirin altogether. But on top of that, these patients also had fewer bleeding complications, the treated patients mm -hmm. as compared to placebo, and also mortality was lower. So this is very encouraging, but also intriguing, because I think it may be the first time for an antiplatelet agent to show that it would lower bleeding complications. Do you think this is all coincidence and chance? because of the small study size, or is there a potential mechanism involved? Um, so I think that it, there is a, a mechanism involved, and uh, um, because I think that, a, again, like uh, hemostasis can really be preserved when uh, um, GIP6 is uh, targeted. Um, and also, um, <coughs> um, yeah, so uh, hemostasis can really be preserved as a when GIP6 is targeted, and also I think it depends on the, the reason why you are tar targeting an antiplatelet. So let's say, uh, as I said before, on the plaque material, it has been shown that uh, the main interaction is uh, be between uh, GIP6 and collagen, so this is, uh, I think, very relevant. And also I would like to say that uh, um, in patients um, who have a heart attack, uh, one of the problem is uh, um, the occlusion of uh, microvess microvessels, and uh, so that's a problem because uh, uh, oh, even after a procedure, so a PCR procedure, one of the problem is uh, the occlusion of uh, other small vessels because, like, there, there are some residuals of the plaque um, which can still trigger platelet activation, and uh, in, in that context, it, it has also been shown that uh, GIP6 uh, inhibition can prevent. Um, the, the occlusion of these vessels and can occlusion. improve actually microperfusion, whereas yeah. it's known that uh, the, cur the current use of other antiplatelet drugs yeah. uh, does not give this uh, advantage. So I think but, it's But still you're pointing to a primary and antithrombotic mechanism. And I was thinking, could you also consider that it would have an anti-inflammatory action because it um, might interfere with the platelet leukocyte interaction, for instance. I'll, I'll tell you what I mean uh, in the sake of, for the sake of time also. 
uh, that by doing, perhaps doing that, interfering in inflammation, it may help to restore the endothelial barrier damage that occurs during yeah. uh, the acute ischemia in stroke. Yes, that would that be a possible? Yeah, yeah, actually, reason? yeah, that that could be possible, and uh, um, yeah, I think it it, it was shown that uh, GP6 GP6 can be involved in inflammation, and uh, that uh, uh, this is also um, organ uh, organ and stimulus dependent. And uh, if I'm not wrong, um, there is also a paper showing uh, the role of uh, um, GP6 in, uh, in stroke that uh, could uh, reduce actually the local inflammation and therefore improving. Uh, than the the, um, the outcome of uh, the the treatment, but so that may also be a protective mechanism. Yes, indeed. there, there could okay. be a protective mechanism, um, and also the use of GP6 has not been uh, shown to impact with inflammatory hemostasis, which is uh, because GP6 has been shown to be involved in uh, vascular integrity and inflammatory hemostasis. So this can can be tricky if you think about it, but actually it has been shown that G G targeting GP6 still preserve inflammatory hemostasis. So again, I think that's promising, but of course like clinical trials are needed and more studies, yeah. Uh, I'm very pleased with your answers and I would have lost to, loved to discuss venous thrombosis, but <laughs> uh, I'm afraid I have to, to leave that for another moment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Give the word back to the prorector. Thank you very much, Professor Trincate. Uh, the opposition will be continued by Professor Morgan. He's Professor of Cardiovascular Genetics at the University of Birmingham. Welcome at this uh, ceremony. Pleased to have you here. The floor is yours. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, candidate. Um, I'd like to um, congratulate you on your presentation, but also the quality of your thesis. Um, you've clearly done very well and published several papers in very good journals, so well done on that. Thank you. Um, so I just now have a few questions. Um, I'm going to start with um, basically the front cover of your um, your thesis, was, I believe was written by a family member, by your father, is that right? Yeah. Would you like to tell us a few words of what that actually is and what it means to you? Uh, so this is uh, meant to be a spread platelet. And uh, yeah, I yeah, I asked my father to, well, because I, I, I <laughs> So I, I saw um, a painting of this uh, spread platelet, so I got in love with it, and then I decided I want it on my thesis. So I asked my father to do it because I'm very bad at um, drawing. So yeah, I hope that you like it, yeah. Thank you, great job, great job. Um, yeah, so just to continue. So, so f um, in the literature, there's only a handful of patients with reported GP6 deficiency i.e. with GP6 mutations. So why do you think there are so few that have been published so far? Um, yeah, I think the reason there are so few because so these patients, uh, they have been found because uh, um, they under, underwent some uh, also small um, clinical treatment. Uh, and so they, they were found to be, um, to, to bled a bit more of a normal patient, or for example, they went to the doctor because they had like a, a bruising, so they were, um, um, yeah, wondering why they had uh, increased bruising, but I guess that uh, the other patients have not, um, have not been found because they don't really have uh, a clinical manifestation of this uh, mutation, so there was no need for them to Hmm. seek me medical attention so they're mild yeah they're very, yeah, mild. very yeah. mild okay yeah. yeah and in terms of all the patients that have been described is the variability in the phenotype what, what kind of severity of phenotype do they have so I the, the the bleeding phenotype is very mild um, so in in the thesis we reported the BAT score so the, the bleeding assessment tool and uh, uh, there was oh, one patient with uh, a slightly higher bleeding phenotype, uh, which was around uh, 19, uh, but there was also some other um, individuals with a bot score very low, very almost close to zero, and uh, it's not clear why that patient has uh, a higher bleeding phenotype, but it could be in some probably genetic variants. Mm. Uh, yes. In so the so you think you could there could be additional genetic variants that are maybe contributing? Uh, yeah, the... probably some um, s single nucleotide variants that could uh, uh, cause the the measure of bleeding, 
uh, but um, I, mm. I, I don't think this has been very well investigated again mm. because there are just 11 patients, so. How do you think we can find those extra variants? Say again, sorry? How do you think we go about finding those extra variants that might contribute to the phenotype? Uh, well, I think uh, you need to sequence the genome of these patients, but first you need to find the, the patients. So. Yeah, thank you. Um, so a related question, just moving on to the Chilean patients, really. So as you mentioned in, um, on published in chapter three of the, of the book, of the thesis, um, the Chilean patients have a frame shift mutation, which is relatively common in that population. So you've, from your talk and your thesis, you mentioned there's 4,000 plus individuals. So can you comment on maybe why the, this number has not really been presented in the clinic in terms of the number? Why you've only got 11 today that you found? I, I think that, uh, yeah, these, these patients, these individuals don't, do not have problems, not uh, um, uh, face any difficulties. So that's why they don't, uh, again, like seek medical attention. They have not been identified so far. But I don't know, like, if um, it can happen that in case they have a major bleeding event. Uh, then if eventually it would find out, or if it might be that some of these individuals are actually uh, went to the hospital for some problems, but they have not been genotyped, so it's not so far known if, or they have not been tested actually um, to see if it was related to GP6, the reason for the bleeding, or if it was related to other um, issues. So yeah, I think that's okay. the reason. Thank you. Um, so what do you think the implication of this in, in disease in this particular population who carry these GP6, this GP6 commutation? I think that uh, um, these individuals probably, they can be protected from arterial thrombosis, but um, it's difficult to say because we don't have high numbers, so you also need a good screen screening of uh, the, the mutation and the individuals mm -hmm. and see again like if they really in, in, in specific circumstances if they will have some benefits or not but yeah. Uh, yeah what kind of numbers do you think we'll have to look at to get enough power to address this um well i think we need around at least 1000 2000 at least mm, i mean more. that that's that's I, mm. normally clinical trial i think are based around 2,000, 3,000 individuals, so I guess we need that amount probably, maybe 1,000 is enough already, okay. yeah. If it's very striking, so yeah. Yeah, okay, I think, am I out of time, I think? Yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the opposition will be continued. Sorry. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Harrison, Dr. Harrison is Associate Professor at the University of Birmingham. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, dear, candid dear candidates, thank you very much for presenting a beautiful uh, thesis. I've enjoyed reading it uh, over the last few days on the train every day. And I have a question related to one of your major conclusions. You're saying, uh, GP6 is a useful antiplatelet therapy aiming to prevent thrombus growth but to, uh, and to induce instability of the less activated platelets. Um, how do you think GP6 inhibition will compare to existing therapies such as aspirin and P2Y12 inhibition? Dear esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Um, so I think that uh, it's known that inhibition of uh, um, uh, P2I12 um, and the use of the current antiplatelet drugs in general as some, uh, we can call them, I think, downsides or like they're not 100% effect effective in solving the problem. So for sure we need the use of an, uh, a new antiplatelet uh, drug. Um, I think that uh, many trials have been performed um, 
over anticoagulant, like, such as uh, varoxaban, that is an inhibitor of factor 10. But still also in that case, I don't believe that it's um, uh, extremely successful. Uh, for example, the use of anticoagulant has been shown to, um, and specifically of rivaroxaban, has been compared to anti drugs, and the use of only anticoagulant alone um, has been shown at high dose to be beneficial, but also to cause intracranial bleeding. So I don't think that is something that um, we want to have from an antithrombotic reagent. At the same time, we know that uh, anti platelet drugs have uh, some side effects. One of, of them is, of course, the use of uh, the, the co because they cause uh, bleeding, but sometimes they're also ineffective in preventing thrombosis. So putting this together, we surely need a new anti platelet uh, um, agent, and I think that GP6 can be one of them. First of all, because it's not going to affect uh, hemostasis, and second, because of uh, the, um, how the, the, like if we consider the structure, the, the current model of uh, a thrombus structure, uh, GIP6 uh, is involved in different steps. So I think we can really target uh, GIP6 and its path pathway in different um, steps of thrombus formation. So I think it would be good both for primary intervention, but also for secondary intervention. Of course, um, I think that probably uh, GIP6 uh, um, inhibitors we need to be combined with other drugs. I'm not entirely sure because I think we need more studies on this and we need to com co compare them, but I think uh, that's why it's, it's promising. That's a very, very good answer. Thank you. So I've got a related question, which comes back to your Chilean population of patients that you study with GP6 deficiency. So in chapter three, in the appendix of chapter three, you show the BAT scores, the ISGH BAT scores, bleeding assessment tool scores. Do you think those scores really reflect a mild deficiency? So what do, you, what do we mean by a mild deficiency and how is that reflected in BAT scores usually? Mm, I think that, uh, well, um, the BAT score of 19 probably is not that mild. So th this, this individual, this patient actually went uh, to the hospital and uh, uh, faced the bleeding on um, uh, uh, different occasions. So in this case, in, in, in the case of that individual, um, I wouldn't say that that's a very mild phenotype. But um, that's also the only individual with that high BAT score. And uh, the other individuals actually have uh, a very low um, bleeding and uh, BAT score. So I think compared, if we think of uh, overall, like the, the BAT score is very low for these patients. I would define them a mild bleeding phenotype, one around five, six, So a number of them are higher than that. Did you did you exclude the possibility of a combined defect of some sort in these individuals? Um, say again, sorry. Did you exclude the possibility that some of these individuals with the higher BAT scores may have had a combined hemostatic defect with their GP6 defect? Mm. We cannot exclude this. I I, I think that. I, I don't think this patient was found to have um, a combined, um, other combined um, mutation that could affect the bleeding. Um, but I don't know how well this patient has been investigated. And also I think uh, could be that this, this patient has uh, because this patient, they have uh, different uh, haplotypes, so like they are not, they have the same mutation, but they have uh, many variants, so it's not a conserved mutation. So it might be that they have other um, single nucleotide variant that could influence the, the bleeding, but um, I, I, yeah, that's what I can say. Okay. So I have a final question about the potential role of GP6 in venous thrombosis. 
um, which uh, was alluded to by the first questioner. So what's, what do you think the role of GP6 in venous thrombosis is? Because you've got a beautiful chapter on that. Yeah. Um, so I think that uh, uh, in the past, venous thrombosis was considered to, more, to be more a, um, a disease of the coagulation. So platelets were not considered to be that involved in uh, venous thrombosis. But I think now we have evidence that actually platelets can uh, interfere with inflammation and also that they can have a role in a venous thrombosis. I think, um, so for example, one of the, 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 um, the, the work supporting this, uh, this uh, um, theory is the, the work on the SNAP23 deficient uh, mice that actually were shown to be protected by arterial thrombosis and venous thrombosis. So I think that uh, the role of uh, um, GIP6 in this context uh, can be related surely to uh, the inflammation because GIP6 has been shown to um, um, promote uh, uh, um, the um, uh, neutrophil, uh, neutrophil activation uh, in the context of steroid inflammation and uh, um, also, it has been uh, shown to be involved, if I'm not wrong, in uh, pneumonia, uh, so in model of pneumonia, interfering with inflammation. So again, uh, and of course, we know that in inflammation is uh, one of the causes of venous thrombosis. Then I think that uh, it could be um, related with venous thrombosis also because of uh, um, its um, kind of cooperation with the GP1B, because we know that uh, uh, GP1B is important for venous thrombosis, and uh, GP6 has been found to uh, associate with the uh, um, GP1B. Um, so there could be a, a, a cooperation. And then, um, and then yeah, the, the, the fact that um, when uh, the venous thrombosis formed, uh, it started by a uh, leukocyte that uh, induced the production of uh, uh, a tissue factor and then uh, fibrin formation. And of course, GIP6 is known to bind to fibrin formation. So I think these are aspects that could be investigated better to understand the role of GIP6 in venous thrombosis and that not exclude this receptor from uh, venous thrombosis. Excellent answers. Thank you very much. That concludes my questions, and uh, thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Uh, the opposition will be continued by Professor van Zandvoort. Professor van Zandvoort is Professor of Advanced Optical Microscopy at Maastricht University and Imkar Aachen. Dear candidates, in Anji Tutto. Uh, I would like to uh, compliment you with your thesis, very well written and very easy to read. Um, and I would like to also uh, f congratulate the family and friends uh, in this. Um, I have some questions and the first one I would like to ask one of the paranymphists to read Proposition 11. Scientists can have great ideas during drinks. <laughs> But when drinking too much, they forget the great ideas. Gina Perella, and a British scientist. <laughs> okay, so one of the f I have two questions about this uh, proposition. The first one is: Do you remember how many uh, great ideas you forgot? Many. <laughs> Can you count them? <laughs> and the second one is: Did you also forget who the British scientist was because the no, scientist no, was I in the bar, or? <laughs> Yeah, no, no, I know the British scientist. Can you share that with us? Then we can uh, say by himself if you want. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so my more serious questions yeah. are about, uh, let me check, page 168. It's a question that won't surprise you. It's about an image. Mm -hmm. um, and in that figure, you describe clustering uh, uh, using storm imaging. Yes. Now, the fact that you use storm imaging is very nice. Yeah. Uh, I like that. Uh, the rest of the images are mostly uh, standard wide field and bright field microscopy. Uh, but it also raises a question to me as you, say, you state that there's no change in clustering. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, I don't see a positive control showing that using storm you could actually detect that. Mm. Okay. Did you do a positive control? Um, 
so I, I did not perform this experiment, so for me it's a bit um, uh, difficult to answer this question. Uh, I'm not sure you can have a post in control for clustering, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about this yet. Okay, so, um, so when you think about that, could you speculate about that? What could be a way to do that? I don't know the answer, so yeah. it's a up way to, to you. have a positive control for uh, yeah. clustering. Mm. Well, well, it's known that like GIP6 um, makes clusters, so it could be used as positive control for clustering for platelets, but um, mm, other receptors. I'm not sure how well this is. Could, yeah. could you could you have a negative control where there's absolutely no clustering? Uh, yeah, surely you can have. Um, because then the measurement itself would be the positive control. Yeah, I know what you mean, but um, so the thing is that as I'm as I'm not uh, um, accustomed with this technique. I, I don't know. I'm not sure about how like how good the negative control needs to be, as well as a positive control. So I, I'm not entirely sure about what could be a negative uh, control. The, that I understand because you you haven't done the experiment. But could you speculate on what could be a negative control where you don't expect any clustering? Any clustering? Well, I would just simple. use the. Um, a, a ligand which uh, does not uh, cause um, a very strong activation, but um, I I think this is tricky because uh, so proteins where they are coated they behave different from when they are in solution. Um, so I I, will, I I can think of. BWF because it's known that uh, does not induce a very strong platelet activation. Mm -hmm. So I, I I don't think it's gonna. I think it's gonna be a, a good negative control. But again, I'm not entirely sure what's gonna happen with this uh, method methodology. Okay. So um, another question I have mm -hmm. is on page 112. 112. Of course, also on an image. Um, you show some uh, SAM images of fibrin networks. Yes. Um, and there you actually indicate that in the legend I read, and also in the text uh, accompanying that, I read there is no difference in structures because uh, there's no, they are not visible uh, between the fibrin plus from Willebrand factor, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, when I look at these structures, all four are different. I would classify them as absolutely different. Do you have a reason to say specifically, do you look at something that I oversee? So I think what we were looking uh, when, what we were considering when we look at these uh, surfaces was how dense and packed the fibrin, uh, fibers were, and we could not notice a difference in this sense. Uh, mm -hmm. between the first surface and second surface, so when BWF was added. I know that they don't look entirely 100% um, identical, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, we were, we were more pointing out the fact that the, the fibers are less dense uh, or more dense. Mm -hmm. And you don't see a difference? We, well, the thing is that... Um, we, we just wanted to prove with, the, uh, with these, uh, by imaging them by SAM, we wanted to prove that we had a fibrin surface uh, and we wanted to look at the fibrin surfaces more closer, but um, we were more interested in the effect of uh, fibrin and the presence of D BWF in terms of platelet activation. And so I think we investigated these with um, the flow studies. So in a way our answer so our um, questions were answered, and um, yes. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, did you consider to uh, also use Storm for this? No. 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 Okay. We did. <laughs> Pity. I think there's no more time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Professor Van Zandvoort. Uh, the opposition will be continued by Dr. Salis Crawley, who is a lecturer in cardiovascular science at the University of London. Dr. Salis. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me all right. Um, first of all, I would like to join the co-examiners uh, in congratulating the candidates for a beautiful presentation and very well written thesis. Um, yes, I very much enjoy uh, reading uh, reading the thesis, uh, and also like the amount of work was uh, was quite uh, impressive with the eight publications I think were, that was listed listed. So. My questions, uh, and I think one of my first question I wanted to ask you was related to um, the importance of platelet leukocyte interaction in cardiovascular diseases and the thrombus formation. And I think you started to uh, to answer some of these uh, uh, some of that question with uh, answering um, Dr. Harrison on the uh, venous thrombosis and the role of uh, uh, GP6 in venous thrombosis. So can you ca recapitulate the, what could be um, uh, the importance of GP6 in uh, perhaps in platelet leukocyte interaction? Can you think of, and why would that be a good target for um, an antithrombotic um, agent? Dear esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Um, so I think that uh, we know that platelet and leukocytes interact. And we know that uh, this is an important interaction which can trigger, of course, thrombosis, where, um, yeah, we, that can trigger thrombosis. And I think uh, one of the um, most important evidence of uh, GIP6 relation uh, with uh, um, inflammation in the, in the context of uh, venous thrombosis was that uh, GIP6 could induce uh, neutrophil secretion. And then, of course, it could trigger um, a platelet activation because we know that uh, um, the, um, the gypsy could, could induce the formation of uh, nets, and uh, we know that nets can activate platelets. However, um, I think uh, when we consider the interaction with the platelet and the leukocytes, there are many things to take into account. And it has also been shown that um, it really depends on the, uh, the, the general context of the disease and also the organ and also the type of uh, stimulus. Um, but it's a proof of concept that uh, GIP6 can interact with the uh, uh, leukocyte and of course can be a trigger for, uh, um, for uh, thrombosis. Thank you. So um, in the same vein, and you already have a lot uh, of questions, it's like, what is your opinion, in your opinion, the best anti-GP6 blocker? Uh, would you target the collag collagen-induced signaling or the fibrin fibrinogen induced signaling? And what do you think, in which scenario would it be the most efficacious, like arterial versus venous thrombosis? It's a bit of a complicated question, but... <laughs> Um, so I think in the uh, in we can we can block interaction with GP6. However, I'm not 100% um, sure this, for example, interaction with collagen. I'm not 100% uh, sure it can be a good target for venous thrombosis. Uh, so I think in, in this context, I would probably target the signaling because uh, I think it's. It can, it can prevent the activation regardless of the, 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 um, the trigger. So I, 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 would, I would rather target uh, GIP6 signaling than a specific receptor because um, so, so far uh, we know that uh, um, uh, glenzosmab is uh, in a clinical trial and is an anti-GIP6 agent. And uh, uh, so probably this receptor, uh, sorry, this uh, drug is uh, successful because it can inhibit binding to collagen or fibrinogen. 
Uh, but we have also another example of a drug which was not successful, and this was Ribacept, and it has been suggested that probably this drug was not successful because it was just targeting a specific GP6 interaction. So in a wider context of uh, um, thrombin inflammation and venous thrombosis that of course is triggered by inflammation, I would rather target the signaling than a specific uh, ligand binding. Thank you. Maybe one last question, if I, if I have time. So this is related. I would like to uh, have your view uh, upon like the importance of the GP1B alpha receptor for thrombus um, formation stabilization. We know that this is important for initial adhesion and under arterial shear, but it's related to your results in uh, chapter four and using an anti-GP1B alpha antibody in your, in your essays. What we observed with, when we inhibit um, uh, GP1B was, uh, um, a, was just a decrease in platelet adhesion. And uh, of course, we know that uh, uh, GP1B is involved in platelet adhesion through BWF. Um, I think it has been shown that uh, uh, we know that uh, G in, in the activation of uh, GP1B and for the role of a GP1B, GP6 is important, but I think it has also been shown that when the integrin alpha 2 b beta 3 is activated, uh, then this can um, um, kind of mask uh, the absence of uh, uh, GP1B. And so since we, have, we had a fibrin surface, uh, it might be that probably that's only the reason why we, we only saw an effect in platelet adhesion and not in platelet activation, because of course, uh, uh, fibrin can activate and bind the integrin alpha to be beta 3. Okay, thank you very much. I am. Thank you very much, Dr. Salis. Uh, the opposition will be continued by Dr. Armstrong. He's a lecturer in pharmacology at Queen Mary University of London. Dr. Harrison, uh, Dr. Armstrong, sorry. <laughs> Too many polls. Thank you very much, Pro Rector. And thank you very much, the candidate, for your uh, very clear presentation and well written thesis. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, data and a lot of results in there, and so I commend you for, uh, for all your efforts over the years. My question I'd like to start by considering that GP6 as a receptor is known to be shed. In your thesis, you talk about the, the, the signaling potential signaling roles of GP6 as the thrombus grows. You get this, uh, you hypothesize a continual signaling through the, the receptor. How would you fit the, um, the, the, the action of GP6 shedding in the growing thrombus, and is this consistent with a continual um, signaling process? Um, dear esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Um, so I think that um, GIP6, GIP6 shedding does not affect the role of uh, GIP6 in, uh, in the thrombus growth and stability. And uh, GIP6 is not, not only the only receptor that is shed uh, during platelet activation. So I think uh, shedding is something that uh, happens um, during platelet activation and when a receptor is involved. And um, I, I, I don't think this affects the role of, uh, yeah, the role of a GIP6 because even if it's, uh, even if there is a GIP6 shedding, there, there still be receptors able to um, interact with the other ligand and to um, uh, participate in, in thrombus growth. Thank you. My follow-up to that is about, um, we observe uh, in, in numerous uh, clinical conditions, low GP or lower GP6 uh, expression levels, which is thought to be consistent with, um, with sh uh, activation induced shedding. Based on um, in these uh, same patients, we see higher levels of circulating fibrin and D-dimer um, levels. Can you speculate on whether you think there's a pathological role for the fibrin, circulating fibrin and, and D-dimers in, in such conditions? So um, 
so solar body dimers are known to to be present during uh, uh, um, some conditions, um, and I think they can be used to look at the level of uh, platelet activation. Um, so yeah, in a, in a specifically clinic condition. Um, so we know that uh, D-dimer can inhibit um, platelet activation by other receptors where they are not in solution, they, they, so they can still bind to, to platelets. So we, we observed that they could inhibit, um, for example, collagen activation of uh, GIP6 when they were pre-added in, into the solution. So of course it's something to consider, but uh, um, I think uh, formation of uh, D-dimer is uh, um, probably can be stopped before, like a massive amount of uh, D-dimers, circulating D-dimers, can be prevented, uh, because I think that um, in some cases, the high level of D-dimer is also related with uh, a very traumatic event uh, and, and, so, and also like when uh, the clinical condition of the patients are getting very um, extremely worse. So I think uh, this can be prevented and um, yes. Oh, very good, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to finish with asking, um, I, you mentioned earlier in your, um, in your presentation that GP6 is known to be involved in vascular integrity which implies that sort of the lack of vascular integrity is linked to bleeding. And yet in your Chilean population where there are GP6 um, homozygous knockout uh, individuals, you get very little bleeding. So where is GP6 still important for vascular integrity or are we being misled by, by uh, previous uh, experimental protocols? Um, I think, uh... The role of uh, GIP6 in vascular integrity as, uh, was shown to be uh, related with uh, the, the, the trigger, so the type of uh, heat. Um, so it's, it's difficult to answer this question because I don't think there is uh, one uh, specific mechanism happening. Uh, in, in some situations, surely it has been shown to be more important, some other less important, but um, overall, uh, as far as I know, it's not been uh, observed to be a problem. What I mean that targeting GIP6 was a problem in terms of uh, vascular integrity. So the, my understanding was that the vascular integrity information came from GP6 knockout mice. Do you think there's a species difference there? Gina Perella. The time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room. Thank you. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. In the meantime, let's take a closer look at Maastricht University's renowned teaching method, problem-based learning. Once the prorector reconvenes the session, we'll tune in and continue the live stream.
Problem-Based Learning, or PBL. What does that mean exactly? Three of my fellow students and I will show you around. Every week, we analyze a different case or issue together. We discuss the case and everyone can contribute different perspectives to the group discussion. If we get stuck, our tutor helps us out and suggests what we could do next. I prefer going to the library to prepare. Here, I can focus and I have quick access to books or journals that help me understand the case. Today, I can also train my stitching skills in the skills lab, where you can immediately put into practice what you've learned. After a day like this, I like going to the gym to clear my head and get ready for the next day. At UM, you meet people from all around the world. Hello, guys. Some of them are doing their change semester here, and they often say that PBL helps them learn and retain things very easily. I can understand why. It's a very active way of learning because you have to bring your own perspective to real life cases. You have a lot of freedom to manage your time, your studies, your hobbies and your work. Of course, that also means a lot of responsibility. Right now, for example, I'm arranging my exchange semester in Madrid. How cool is that? In this group session, we're the managers who have to allocate the resources of a real company. This is how we put into practice what we learned this morning. Studying here means being proactive and learning to plan well. Prioritizing and performing well under stress are great skills that help you develop as a person. But now, it's time to grab a coffee at the Student Service Center. Right now, we're at the Brightlands Camelot campus. Here we can apply knowledge from lectures and tutorials in a practical setting. This helps us understand what we have learned and further develop our lab skills. Today, we're determining the amounts of cholesterol in various products. What I really like is the project periods at the end of each semester, where we complete a full research project that includes planning, collecting data, analyzing, and presenting the findings. That way we learn how research works and we're able to see what it's like to be a real scientist. After practicals, I have to write a lab report that also helps me process everything I have learned today. UM has a lot of learning spaces where you can work on your own or with other students. This evening, I'm meeting my friends for a movie night organized by the MSP Study Association. If you study law, you have to read quite a lot. Not all information is relevant, so you learn how to easily find the information you need to solve your case. In the afternoon, I have to give a presentation, so I like to practice it with a fellow student. Later today, a lawyer is giving a lecture. This will help us better understand the case we're working on. Speaking in front of a group is quite exciting the first time round, but you get to use to it quickly. And having to present helps you also to adopt knowledge better. What I like the most is that we sometimes get to enter a plea in front of a real judge. These mood courts are really exciting. Now it's time for drinks with friends. <laughs> Studying is important, but so is relaxing once in a while.
Martina Perella. The degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Heemskerk is authorized to confirm upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Please, Omar. We first get the promise. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I promise. And by the authority vested in us by law, and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I, he I hereby by confer upon you, Gina Parella, the degree of doctor, and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and other members of the committee, and affixed with the official seal of the university. The laudatio will be given uh, by your first uh, promoter in Birmingham, Professor Stifatten. Prorector, opponents, members of... I've got to stand. Oh, right. <laughs> Prorector, opponents, members of faculty um, of both universities, friends and families. It's with pleasure that I can say a few words on behalf of your supervisors, Gina. A PhD is a very challenging thing to take on and should not be taken on lightly. A PhD, to embark on a dual PhD with two different sets of supervisory teams, two different methods of thesis examination, brings in an absolutely another level of challenge, not only for the student, but also for the supervisors, because it was also a first for us. So you were the test, and my, how lucky we are to have appointed you. But then nobody told us about COVID-19 as well. But Gina, you have many qualities that really um, allowed you to rise to this challenge. I don't need to tell you all of them, but I will mention a few to your family and friends. You have a very high work ethic. You have naturally talented. You have real drive. Your enthusiasm and excitement is amazing. It, everybody picks this up. You have a sheer love for science. You're a truly fantastic team player who takes an interest in not only the project, but everybody in the laboratory, and that even extends to their partners. <laughs> and sometimes you don't tell me everything, which is good. And you're a fantastic communicator, and I will come back to that. And I have to mention Matteo. Um, he's always been in there so to support you. He went firstly to Birmingham with you, then from Birmingham to Maastricht, from Maastricht back to Birmingham, he is the perfect mobile boyfriend. I think people could learn. So well done, Matteo. You've had a really very successful four years. Two first author manuscripts and one review in the leading journals in the field and eight papers in total. And the thesis consists entirely of published work, which is something that may, be normal, may happen in Maastricht but never happens in Birmingham. So very, very well done. Your contributions have made a significant under, co contribution to understanding of the role of GP6 in platelet biology. If we look back what we knew four years ago and what we know today, it would really move the field forward. 
And I think your work has really emphasized its potential importance as a target for a new class of antiplatelet agent. And that what, and, and this, if this comes to fruition, it could one day say, say tens of lives, tens of thousands of lives, if not hundreds of thousands of lives. So very few students make such a significant contribution to the field, so well done. You've developed as a first class researcher and you have all of the qualities to really achieve a, a, a very successful career in science. And you've also brought a great sense of fun and mem many memories over the last four years in both sets of laboratories. And I can tell you now, a laboratory is a much, much better place with a Gina there. So, well done. I can tell a, a couple of stories. So when Gina first arrived in January in 2018 in Birmingham, she joined um, myself, other members of the team, and also the team of Robert Arians in Leeds at a science away weekend in Yorkshire. What we didn't tell you, it would be a very snow-covered weekend. Matteo brought Gina a pair of boots, walking boots, with a heel. Now, Gina spent much of the weekend saying, do my boots look good? Do my feet look good in the boots? Do you like the heel? Um, surely we're not going to go walking in the snow. And it is so cold. I'm sure you remember it. And then there were two trips to Chile with Magdi, you and myself, to work with Dr. Diego Mazzoni and the very few patients in the world who do not have GP6. We've heard a lot about that today. We faced many challenges. On the very first trip, we did not expect a power cut on the second day. They don't have power cuts, but they did. On the second trip, we did not expect your suitcase not to arrive on a direct flight. It had the apparatus for the trip, but somehow we managed. We improvised, we did all sorts of things, and it led to the manuscript in Blood Advances that I think will become a science citation classic and will for sure will be cited for many years to come. And I feel very privileged to work with both of you and on those trips and with Diego. Diego's hospitality was amazing and something we will always remember. Took us to his apartment at the beach, he drove us there, Gina sang songs all the way. Um, <laughs> Uh, we went to the local wineries. It's not all science that we do in the, the lab. You know, we went to the restaurants. One restaurant just consisted of meat, as far as we could see. We wanted to drink white wine, but the one white wine they had wasn't available. It was um, a, a weekend. And then Gina spent most of the time talking to all the locals in Spanish. Um, at this point, I should say that Gina doesn't actually speak Spanish. But somehow she finds a way to communicate through hand movements, smiles, and everybody understands what you're saying. It was a really fantastic time. On the second trip, and this is a journey that I will never forget, and I don't think either of you will forget for various reasons, we were going to go into a national park but the National Park was closed due to strike action. How you can close a National Park due to strike action, I do not know. So Gino rang a, former, a member of Diego's laboratory and he said, there's this wonderful hotel in the Andes, but the road to the hotel is for a four by four. And we didn't have a four by four. It was only 20 kilometers, but it took us an hour and a half to get there at one moment. Gina felt so sorry for me. She said, let's stop the car now and let's walk. Not only would we have blocked the road, it was also a mile and a half, Gina. So I don't think that was possible. And then we arrived at this, what was almost like an oasis of this hotel, right in the middle of the Andes. The condors were flying overhead. And it was the most beautiful hotel in the world that I've seen, that I've ever been in. And then we went for a walk. And Gina, I think, finally now realizes how nice it is to walk in the countryside, even without boots that everybody can admire. Although the snake did cause us a bit of a problem. Look, on behalf of Johan, 
Magdi and Mark, I really want to congratulate you on a very successful four years. Uh, to wish you and Matteo the very best in your future careers. You. And we will follow that with a great deal of excitement. Gina has stayed in Birmingham to work with Julie Rays, who is undoubtedly one of the leading investigators of her generation. She's a lot younger than me. And she's a fantastic, you make a fantastic team. And one day you will be in Julie's shoes in that position. I look forward to when your own students reach this stage. I think you've got very much to look forward to. There are many other countries in the world. I know you like traveling. I know you like languages. There's many other languages that you cannot speak. Mm -hmm. But I really don't think that's ever going to hold you back. Well done. Thank you. Dear Dr. Perella, also on behalf of Maastricht University, I congratulate you with the degree you have acquired. And I also, of course, congratulate your parents, your fiancé, um, husband, boyfriend, boyfriend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a long time boyfriend already, yeah, yeah. I understand. Yeah. And uh, of course, other friends and colleagues with this uh, uh, special occasion because it's been a period of hard work and you didn't have the easiest period of time with the COVID uh, lockdowns and everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, really congratulations with all the work you've done and um, the degree you have acquired. Thank you. I also congratulate your supervising team. Uh, one is still in England and mm -hmm. is not present, unfortunately. Uh, and then I would like to ask, uh, thank the members of the Corona who are here and those who are online, especially all the people from the UK. Thank you very much for participating in this uh, ceremony. It's always a pleasure to have so many people from abroad. And uh, then with this, I'd like to close this ceremony. And uh, I will ask the, uh, the audience, except the parents and the boyfriend who can stay here, uh, to leave the hall. Uh, we then make some... ...refter for drinks, I guess. Yes. Yes? Okay, thank you. So...